New Orleans, early 1990s. A city shrouded in mystery and filled with rich and dark traditions. A series of gruesome ritualistic murders has the local population living in fear. The police are stumped, unable to find the culprit behind these chilling crimes. Whispers of a dangerous voodoo cult fill the air, but there is no concrete proof to be found. Can an unassuming local writer unravel the truth and bring light to these dark events? Let's dive into the enigmatic world of Gabriel Knight, Saints of the Fathers, a classic point-and-click adventure game that will keep you glued to the screen till the end. Before we start, don't forget to like and subscribe for more satisfying and relaxing ASMR gaming content. And now, let's start our adventure. New Orleans, the city of jazz and the city of magic. Today is the 18th of June, 1993. I'm Gabriel Knight, an out of luck writer, owner of a bookshop called St. George's Books, located in the French Quarter. As usual, I wake up quite late in the day, after another restless night. For the past couple of weeks, I've been having horrible nightmares. They are rather confusing and creepy. When I wake up, I don't remember much. Mostly a blur of images. People burned at a stake, serpents and a strange lion-like creature. Plus, I always have a strong feeling I'm about to die in some horrible way. After waking up, I join my one and only employee, Grace Nakimura, in the shop. Ah uh, yes, I live in the back room of the shop. Grace has been working for me for the past three months. She's pursuing her PhD in history at Yale, but decided to take a break for the summer, and this job is a good fit for her. She really likes books, and she's quite a scholar. From the start, she has demonstrated to be capable and diligent with her duties. At the same time, she's deliberately nosy and judgmental of my life, both on a business and a personal level. Still, she's basically running all the annoying parts of the business, and she doesn't mind being paid a pittance, and not so regularly either. All in all, I wouldn't want anyone else in her position. While sipping the coffee, I look at the local newspaper. The main headline is about the ritualistic murders that have been plaguing New Orleans recently. In the past couple of months, there have been quite a few of these murders, promptly named the Voodoo Murders, because of the MO of each one. Some traces and elements point to the use of typical Voodoo paraphernalia and symbols. Whether they are fake or real is still up for debate. What is certain is that New Orleans has quite a bit of magical stuff going on, and there are indeed some active voodoo practices in the city. That's why I was attracted to these murders and decided to look into them, possibly to gather ideas for my next book. While reading the newspaper, Grace informs me that two people called me. One is mostly my old friend and detective with the New Orleans Police Department. He has left some pictures for me at the front desk of the police station. The other call was from someone in Germany named Wolfgang Ritter. But that name doesn't mean anything to me. In 1993, calling all 
policies is really expensive. So unless there's a good reason, I won't call him back. He'll call again if it's important. I also asked Grace to do some research about voodoo in New Orleans, specifically interesting places to visit. Two of these are the local voodoo museum and a shop called Dixieland Drug Store. The schedule for the day seems pretty busy. I guess it's time to get a move on. The first stop is the police station. As promised, Mosley left an envelope with two photographs at the front desk. The first is of one of the victims, and it's quite gruesome. The poor guy's body shows deep cuts in his chest, as if his heart was ripped out. The other picture is of Mosley himself. He thinks I will include him in the book, which won't be the case, but for now I won't tell him. While at the station, I learned that my friend is out at a crime scene. Another for the murder. Unfortunately, the officer can't tell me what it is exactly. It's confidential, he says. I call it gatekeeping. I leave the police station and wander around the French Quarter, thinking about how to find out where the crime scene might be. Meanwhile, I pass by the Voodoo Museum and the store Grace mentioned, but they're both closed today. I'll check back tomorrow. After some aimless wandering, I stop in Jackson Square, a popular place in the quarter. The square is just in front of the majestic St. Louis Cathedral, and it's pretty crowded. There's people relaxing on the grass, a couple of small jazz and cajun bands offering some entertainment. There's also a lone drummer, beating a haunting rhythm on an African drum. There are quite a few of them around the quarter. More interesting though, there's a police officer with his bike. Passing by him, I can almost hear from his radio a conversation between what could be the police central and an ambulance. Could that be the ambulance headed towards the crime scene? I cannot quite grasp what they are saying though. There's lots of static and I'm too far away. If only I could get hold of the radio for a minute or so and listen more closely. The opportunity quickly materializes. A mime is going around annoying people by mimicking their movements, and luckily for me, he decides to mock the police officer. The officer is not pleased at all, and starts chasing him around, leaving his bike, and more importantly, the radio unattended. I quickly get closer and tune in. As I suspected, the ambulance is asking for directions to the crime scene. And now I have a location. It's on the shores of Lake Pochantran, along Lakeside Drive, south of the country clubs. Off we go then. I arrive at the scene right after the ambulance. Detective Mosley is not pleased to see me, but he quickly realizes that it could be good for the book to let me look around, especially at the victim. The scene is gruesome. The victim's chest has been ripped open and their heart removed. Even if the photo angle could be fake, they are definitely putting a lot of effort into making it seem real. While we're both looking at the body, a limousine stops by, and all of a sudden, I meet the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. Dark-skinned, deep brownish golden eyes, and a suave voice. The encounter is brief, but in those few seconds 
manages to steal my heart. Mosley quickly notices my altered status and just as quickly informs me that she's Malia Getty, the heir of a really wealthy family, about as far out of reach for me as the moon. Of course, I don't listen to him at all, because A. She's beautiful. B. I have my ways with women. C. The out of reach concept makes me want to meet her even more. And D. If she's a regular at a nearby country club, she might have heard or seen something. After all, the crime scene is right by the side of the road. In the meantime, the ambulance has finished loading the body, so they all leave. I can now freely look around and take notes for the book. I immediately notice that near the body there are strange symbols, probably a pattern drawn in the sand. Most of it has been smeared, but a part is still visible so I decide to copy it in my sketchbook. A few meters away, I also see an indentation in the ground, as if a heavy object was placed there. Upon closer inspection, I notice something shining. Looking closer, I see a snake scale, an iridescent blue snake scale be precise. Judging by the displaced sand, the snake must have been quite big too. I decide to take the snake scale with me. I remember reading that snake scales are rather unique, a sort of fingerprint for snakes. No two are alike. Before leaving, I get closer to the lake shore and notice a patch of what could be clay. For no real reason, besides the fact that I can, I take a lump of clay and put it in my pocket. It's my thing going around with a lump of wet and dripping clay, all right? I head back to the shop and ask Grace to look up Malia Getty for me and get an address. Time to up my game, I'd say. It's been quite a fruitful day after all, and it's time to close the shop. Hopefully, tonight I will get a refreshing sleep with no nightmares. Of course, that was just wishful thinking. Same nightmare again. Someone burned at a stake. Snakes and an animal. The image is clearer this time. I think it's a leopard, not a lion. And of course, that impending feeling of doom. I wake up and I join Grace in the shop, still thinking about the nightmare. I browse the newspaper, but there's nothing interesting. Just another article about the photo murders, implying the photo angle is fake. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about that. While browsing, I asked Grace if she found Malia's address. Of course she did. She's very efficient, even too much. She immediately lets me know that Malia descends from a very wealthy family with a variety of investments. They own three hospitals and are well connected in the financial and political landscape of New Orleans. In short, I have no chances with her, and should look elsewhere, maybe lower, closer to my level. Ah, Grace, never change. Anyway, I get Malia's address, and add meeting her to my already busy schedule for the day, which includes meeting Mosley, stopping by the Volo Museum and a 
Dixieland Drugstore. My first stop is the Voodoo Museum. As I enter, I'm immediately struck by the intense smell of candles and incense. The whole room is filled with voodoo paraphernalia, symbols and strange objects, which I'm pretty sure have been actually used in various moments in time. Some of these objects are really frightening and disturbing. Skulls, severed animal parts, even a small coffin. What strikes me most is the presence of Christian symbols like crosses. A bit blasphemous, if you ask me. Among the numerous objects, I notice a leaflet of a certain magician moonbeam, a voodoo yin, whatever that is. She seems to perform small incantations and readings. Worth a look as well, I'd say. In a corner of the museum, I notice a snake in a plexiglass cage, a python nonetheless. I wish I could check the color of its scales, but I doubt the owner would let me. Besides, I'm not too keen to get up close and personal with a live python. Speaking of the owner, he seems quite a character. His name is Dr. John, a six-foot-tall, broad-shouldered African-American man with a deep, booming voice. He seems friendly, but there is something unsettling about him that I can't quite figure out. Since I'm here to learn about voodoo, I ask him a few questions, and he is quite enlightening. Voodoo is a religion that comes from Africa and is a mixture of African tribal religions and Anglo religions like Catholicism and Protestantism. Voodoo arrived in the West Indies via the slave trade, first settling in places like Haiti and Santo Domingo, then reaching the mainland United States. By the 1830s, a powerful voodoo priestess emerged in New Orleans, the so-called voodoo queen Marie Laveau. She dominated the voodoo scene and somewhat the city of New Orleans for decades. At her death, her daughter continued her legacy. Some rumors suggest that it was not her daughter, but Marie Laveau herself who found a way to extend her life and keep her youthful looks. Lavo's voodoo legacy is so strong that she is still venerated today by various voodoo practitioners. That's really fascinating. I also learn that Lavo's tomb is at St. Louis Cemetery No. 1. I might stop by there as well. Maybe tomorrow. After this deep dive into voodoo history, I decide to leave and visit the Dixieland drugstore. On my way there, I stop by Miss Majinsha Moonbeam. But she's out of town for the next few days. I'll check back later. As I enter the shop, I see the owner busy with an old lady he refers to as Madame Casano. The old lady has a small yapping dog that's rather annoying. Despite the dog, I eavesdrop on their conversation, and it turns out to be quite intriguing. Madame Casano is troubled by sleepless nights and stomach aches, convinced they are caused by evil spells cast by her neighbors and random strangers. She's asking the owner for remedies, as her prayers to the Virgin Mary haven't worked. The owner is more than willing to sell her various oils and powders to dispel the evil. It seems Madame Casano is a regular customer, 
not afraid to use voodoo magic to solve her troubles, despite being very religious. I'm sure it could be interesting to interview her for the book. While they talk, I look around, and I'm mesmerized by the sheer amount of overpriced junk on sale. Oils, charms, powders, animal parts, and more. There's also a promotion for the upcoming St. John's Eve celebration. Spend $50 or more and get a free bottle of Master Gambling Oil or Lover Come Back to Me Oil. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. After a couple of minutes, the old lady leaves and I can finally ask the owner some questions. I learned his name is Willie Walker, but not much else. He seems rather cagey, and he's not inclined to share information. When I ask about the St. John's Eve celebration, he just says it's important in voodoo, but he doesn't know why. Come on, Willie, you're running a shop filled with voodoo paraphernalia. You give detailed advice on countering spells, and you said your family has lived in New Orleans for generations. Yet you know nothing about a major voodoo celebration. Something smells fishy. Things get worse when I ask about Madame Casano. He becomes defensive and upset, refusing to share any information. Another not-in-the-job description task for Grace, I suppose. The only breakthrough comes when I casually ask him about the voodoo murders. Just mentioning them startles him. He quickly utters the words, Capri Sango. It sounds French, but I have no idea what it means. When I ask him about it, he denies he said anything. Go figures. I think this guy knows a lot, but I won't get anywhere with him. At least he gave me a couple of leads to pursue, albeit involuntarily. In the next episode. Mostly, are you saying all the murders have the exact same MO? The victim's heart has been ripped out, a strange pattern drawn next to the body, and there's plenty of blood, all kinds, including animal blood. That's really disturbing. Time to meet Malia. I'm sure she won't refuse to speak to an officer on official police business. Madame Casano knows a lot about voodoo. Suggesting that Marie Laveau is just a front for the real voodoo queen? That sounds far-fetched. 